Hi everyone, thank you for joining my session today. Uh, today, today I'm going to talk about um, how we can build a uh, private cloud, uh, which kind of looks like a public cloud. Rapidly about, about myself. So I'm, my name is Daniel Yasami. I'm a principal cloud solutions architect, uh, working for Morantis. I've been working for Morantis for about uh, five, six years now. Um, and I've always been in, in open source. I've, I've worked in Linux in the past, um, OpenStack, and then now more and more Kubernetes. As I said, um, the idea today for me is to talk about uh, how to build uh, private clouds that can be big public clouds. And the reason for that is, is Multifold. We have customers that came to us and said that they couldn't be, they couldn't use public clouds, and the reason for that is because of cost, for example, because of uh, some of the regions not having public clouds, or simply because of so sovereignty reasons. Um, some of the customers we have cannot put uh, sensitive private data into public clouds. So as such, uh, today I'm going to go through some of the architectural approaches we had with these customers, uh, what we actually implemented uh, for, for them, um, so what we know works. Uh, obviously, this is not an absolute, um, so it can always be modified, it can always be improved, uh, but again, these are some of the reference architectures we have that I'm going to go through. So what we'll be looking at is we'll go through all the different layers that typically uh, builds a private cloud. We'll be going through uh, the YAS, we'll be going through the, the PaaS layer, and then and then through the SaaS layer. Okay, so back to the basics. As I said, we are going to reuse some of the same names and concepts as, as public cloud, so the well-architected uh, framework, for example. Um, this is the target that we want to achieve, right? So if we, are, if we want to, to build something that looks like public cloud, then again, we need to reuse some of the same concepts that they have. Um, in that case, it will be your own data center, or it will be colocation, but that will be yours. Um, we can use any type of hardware. We don't need to be very opinionated in terms of hardware. We can use um, Dell hardware, HP hardware, super macro hardware. Um, any any code servers basically. Uh, we want to provide self-service and API-driven experience, user experience, and ultimately uh, go to the from capex to opex model, so pay as you go model. And there are ways of doing that. Uh, I'm going to, to explain some of the ways of doing that. And at the end of the day, uh, we also want to be able to steer the private cloud architecture to be more bespoke, more customized. Why? Because, and that's one of the one of the good things about building your own cloud is when you use these public clouds, they are very generic. You you have one way of, of consuming these public clouds. They were thought and built by someone else, and you just need and you can only consume these. When you are building your own, you can make them yours based on your use cases, based on what you want to achieve. Right. So the bespoke approach is also very very important here. But that's the, that's the target here. So again, use any of the available hardware, cuts based uh, can be Intel-based, can be AMD-based, Equinix Metal, GreenLake, uh, Lenovo, enable, enable GPU with, with NVIDIA. On top of that, use uh, a virtualization layer to provide the virtual machines, the storage, the network layers, uh, and then leverage Kubernetes to host the applications, right? So that's that's the idea of the of the of the target designs that we have been building for the customers. So open source is very very important here. Uh, we at Mirantis we we massively use uh, open source. Uh, that's part of our of our motto, I would say, in the sense that everything that we do is is uh, given back to the community, and that's that's what we want to achieve across our different product strategies. Uh, and why, why open source is basically why for us open source means sovereignty. Uh, that means that you have the ability to make your own decisions, influence the community, 
and build uh, your product uh, or services out of from what what you want to what you want to, to do, right? Um, but and you, you have you have today a couple of, of um, advantages, but also challenges coming from from using open source. And that's not nothing is, is very very new here, right? You, we have we know that we have adoption of open source. Um, if we look at the statistics across the different uh, geos, we can see that now a lot of innovation is coming from, from, from open source and it gives choice, right? You have the choice and your developers have the choice of actually uh, getting the benefit of these different communities from, from, from open source. But the challenges are real. The challenges around security, the challenges around support, and the challenges around, around skills. Um, and there are ways of addressing these, there are ways of addressing these challenges. Um, the, on the legal part, for example, if you are to look at the, the uh, licenses requirements, the compliance requirements, uh, um, basically to solve these, these, these challenge, this specific challenge, you need to put in place procedures to build your SBOB, for example. And I'm going to show you an example of, the, of, of an SBOB that we typically build. But yes, you need to have a way of, of uh, having an inventory of all the different uh, components that you're using all the licenses that you are using and be ready to share that back to the users that, that's based on, on the license requirements. Community and maintainers and contributors, if you, are to, uh, if you want to be part of these communities, there are ways and, and, and you need to, to, be, to understand the governance of each of these communities, but it's a good way also to, to encourage your developers, to encourage your team to build and provide back to, to, these, to these different communities. And I'll also showcase some of the projects that are available right now where, uh, I, I mean, everyone is more than welcome to, to uh, that we may anticipate it and everyone is more than welcome to come in and contribute. Uh, complexity, support, and reliability. This is also one of the challenges we have. Um, a lot of our customers do want to use open source, or they can use open source on, by their own, but they also want to have support uh, for various reasons. Uh, a very typical comment that we have is, if we are to run uh, workloads for our customers on uh, uh, open source uh, platforms, uh, I want to have someone that supports me for various reasons. Like, for example, if I have a very, very difficult problem to solve, I need to have someone that knows how to, 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 to provide the, the proper, proper fix and, and rapid fix for, for these, uh, for these uh, components. Security, vulnerability, and risk. This is also a, a very real, very real, real uh, challenge. Uh, when you are going to take open source components, there is a process of vetting the code. Right? You will go through various uh, tooling to integrate that, these components within, within your, your platform or your solution. And that means that you need also to have automation that will come, analyze, scan the code, uh, detect the CVEs, and then have a way of fixing these, fixing these CVEs. Right? We at Mirantis, this is something that we do uh, in, a, in an automated, as automated manner as possible, but even then, it is something that takes time. And then, the end, the, the last challenge that we also see around open source and using open source is, is the availability of skills and, and retention of these, of these skills. Uh, this is also uh, a very real challenge in the sense that um, this is a competing market where uh, the skills and, and, and some of these skills are, are hard to, to keep. And basically, then you need to have a way of rewarding your technological experts when they contribute back to these uh, to these communities. Okay, so let's start with the first layer, the yes layer. So in that case, uh, the last layer, the uh, yes layer, we basically build it with with these five different layers in terms of, of the onion model, right? So the first one is security. Uh, that's that's very typical. Security is job zero. Uh, we can't we can't skip that that, that part. And basically here, uh, plan, uh, enforce the least uh, privilege uh, uh, principle, civil trust principle, plan and execute uh, uh, in terms of how, which components you are going to integrate, how you're going to integrate these components, test these, uh, the, the, test these, these, uh, these uh, components, and then deploy them. Right. Rock solid integration. Uh, there is no way that you are going to deploy a solution if you have not tested it properly, if you have not, um, if you have not made sure that all the components that you have integrated are working well together. Which also means that, one, um, you need to build these reference architectures, reference architectures on specific hardware. 
because you have dependencies on the CPU, uh, firmware that you're going to use, the network interfaces that you're going to use, the storage backends that you're going to use. Uh, but that also means that uh, you need to probably select the features that you're going to enable. Let's look at OpenStack, for example, right? You have a lot of features and components that you can integrate or activate in OpenStack, but you don't really need all of these. So why activate all of these OpenStack components when you only need a subset of it, right? So what we typically recommend in this case is just properly select the right subset, and it's going to make your life easier. It's going to make your, your life easier not only to deploy, but also to support, because maintenance is where the challenges are higher. Uh, the right sizing, this is also a, a challenge that we see very, 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 very often. And what I mean by right sizing is you have, you have, uh, figure domains that needs to be manageable in terms of in terms of um, when the blast radius basically right and we have customers that decided to go in uh, a route where instead of having one large OpenStack cluster for example they have 20 30 OpenStack clusters so in that case uh, you risk, you de-risk or you reduce the risk in terms of where you're going to deploy because you don't have one single platform, you have multiple platforms so the application owners can decide which platform they, they can deploy, multiple geos and it just reduces the risk on the infrastructure level. However, it adds a lot of complexity and pressure on the operator layer because maintaining one cloud versus maintaining 30 clouds is not the same thing, right? So you need to have the right trade-off where at some point you don't want to have one single platform, but you also don't want to scale out the amount of platforms that you're running simply because it's going to be unmanageable at some point. There are ways of also reducing that with the point four, which is automation and observability. Observability is key because you do need to have to know what is happening on your platform. But in terms of automation also, you, you need to um, enable or use the proper tooling that will automate a lot of these, of these um, life cycle management of your platform. For example, we at Mirantis, we decided to run OpenStack on Kubernetes. And the main reason we decided to run OpenStack on Kubernetes is to leverage the LCM, uh, the life cycle, the different operators that we can, we can deploy and develop within Kubernetes. A very simple example is self-healing. We then treat OpenStack as more a cattle than pet. In the past, when we were running OpenStack in VMs or in bare metal, uh, we had to protect each of these components and we, we, we didn't want to have any of these components failing. Now, uh, with OpenStack running Kubernetes, we, can, we just don't care, right? So if, for example, any of these services go down, we know that there will be the LCM that will take care of uh, healing these components without having an operator that is in the, the back uh, monitoring these components and making sure that they are running. We just don't look at these services anymore. We know that they are going to run, right? It only means, it, when, when something goes wrong, it means a catastrophic failure. And again, we have design patterns to reduce these, these catastrophic failures. And then the last one is, is prepare for disaster. And when I, that, that's what I meant by catastrophic failure, disaster recovery. And in that case, uh, again, uh, you, can, uh, you need to define your failure domains, whether these are racks, rooms, data centers, and geo data centers, right? Uh, it all depends on your use case and what you want to achieve, but basically in that case, uh, if we are looking at the, one of the target uh, um, deployments that, that most of the, our customers look for, which, are, which is um, geo-redundancy, in that case we have multiple data centers, and here we have two options. Either we deploy dedicated OpenStack clusters in each of these uh, data centers, or we stretch one, data, one open stack cluster across the different data centers, right? Both are valid, depending on the use case, uh, but then again, you have restrictions or uh, constraints, depending on the design. Uh, when you deploy different open stack clusters on each of these data centers, uh, you have less dependency in terms of latency and bandwidth across these different sites. You can, they can be long distance data centers, but when you, uh, uh, but on the other side, this means that you need to manage three, uh, uh, at least three uh, deployments. But when you have one stretch, uh, you have more constraints in terms of latency and bandwidth, but you have only one to manage, one, one API uh, endpoint. Um, so out of that, what we did is we built uh, a reference architecture. This is a very, very simple one, right? Uh, in, in the sense that 
Uh, we are running, we are leveraging the low key principle, so Dynamics Open Stack Kubernetes Infrastructure Principle, so all open source. We are, we have an observability stack, which is, uh, which we deploy, uh, and the main stack is called Stackite. Then we have open stack that runs on top of Kubernetes. We have most, we, our product is called most Kubernetes open stack Kubernetes that will run on Kubernetes, which is not Kubernetes engine. And out of that, we know that we, from that reference architecture, we can run in less than two weeks, or can be even less. Um, when we, when we fully vetted, uh, from hardware up to the deployment of the stack, we were able to reduce the, the, the design and, and deployment and run to less than four hours. Uh, but the way that we did that, uh, from run, uh, design run and, and, and deployment in less than, than two hours, that meant that we had full control of hardware up to the, the, the software stack, right? So we can reduce that, but typically when we look at uh, customer deployment, uh, and where we need to select uh, different uh, different hardware families, then we know that less than less than two weeks you can have something running. And then in terms of upgrade, again, a couple of days, depending again on the scale and uh, what you want to do during these updates. But if you don't want downtime, that means that you're going to live migrate the workloads from one node to another. In that case, it's going to take a little bit more days. But if you are saying that you don't care about downtime of the applications, then in a couple of hours you have your just a uh, You can um, then also uh, increase the capability of your platform uh, for very specific uh, workloads. Here, uh, what we do as part of the YAS uh, platform is also to leverage GPUs, and we have various ways of providing these GPUs to, to uh, the, the other resources. Uh, either we, we provide the full GPU, so the, the, the full physical GPU, to the to the given resource, or we provide a subset of these GPUs, right? So the B GPUs to the to the given to the given platforms. And for that again, we leverage OpenStack uh, and the Nova scheduler, where we would be able to schedule either GPUs or B GPUs towards the, the VM. Right? We have various ways of then of consuming these. Either we consume them as uh, bare metal machines. Um, in that case, either we use OpenStack or we use bare metal machines, right? If we are to use OpenStack, then it's going to go through the Ironic uh, uh, component. So we would activate Ironic in OpenStack, and then through Ironic, then we would dedicate uh, a full, uh, full GPU to the, to, as a workload to the, to the physical machine, right? But then you can also attribute uh, the GPU to uh, virtual machines. Here you have two ways. Either you use uh, GPU pass through. So the GPU pass through is basically we give the full GPU to the to the virtual machine, or we segment it. Uh, and here we have two ways of doing that: either the time slice GPU or the MIG uh, VGP, right? So both are supported. Um, and in that case, uh, you would have a piece of the of the GPU, so the VGPU, allocated to your to your VM. And if you also want to do that in Kubernetes, and in that case. Your VM would be running Kubernetes, so either the VM or the bare metal machine, right? Both cases work. Uh, you will have Kubernetes running in your uh, virtual machine or your bare metal machine, and then in that case, that will be your Kubernetes pod, your Kubernetes pod, sorry, that will be consuming the, the vGPU resource. Okay. Yeah, rapid, rapid uh, difference between time slice vGPUs and, and big GPUs. Uh, now more and more uh, deployments are going towards MIG, but you need to have a proper license compared to time slice which you use. Right? Oh, sorry. Now that we've looked, now that we've looked at the, the uh, YES platform, um, where you have compute capabilities, network capabilities, storage capabilities, it's a multi-tenant uh, environment, so you can have uh, dedicated tenants for your for your resources. Um, we want to leverage Kubernetes as the cloud operating system, uh, and that's the big difference and that the, the big evolution for the past maybe seven years. Uh, when you look at initially how OpenStack operated, uh, a lot of the of the projects like Sara, Murano um, were focused into addressing the application uh, reels. Uh, now we don't really do that anymore in OpenStack. We really use OpenStack for what it, it's made for, the YAS piece. 
but we do leverage Kubernetes for the application piece, right? And the, uh, we do leverage Kubernetes to do the link between the YAS and the application. So for that, um, we at Kubernetes we use the different open source projects. So we use KZRS and KZRS Motron, for example, as two primary uh, open source open source projects. So why KZRS? KZRS is is a lightweight version of Kubernetes. And you have advantages of using KZRS as a lightweight, um, lightweight version of Kubernetes in the sense that it's easy to deploy. It's a binary to download and, 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 to, and to install. It's easy to run because it's just a binary that you're starting. And it's easy to upgrade because upgrade is just replacing, replacing the binary. It's just the upgrade is just replacing a binary from a given from a given uh, version to another version, right? So it is uh, very easy to deploy and and, and maintain. Um, the advantage also of, of KZRS is, is that it can run on multiple hardware families. It's not only made for x86. You can run it on ARM, and there are plans to make it run also on RISC RISC five. Um, Cosmotron is is an operator. So it's an operator that is that is it's a Kubernetes operator that is um, made or built to work with Cluster API to deploy KZRS at uh, at scale. And the interesting idea behind Cosmotron is that you have two ways of managing the control plane. Uh, the first way is to have a shared uh, shared cluster where you will be running the control plane of your child clusters as pod. The second way is would be you would have dedicated uh, dedicated nodes to run your control plane of your child of your child clusters. Right? So you have advantages of using of using both. Like for example, uh, if you are to run some test environments, uh, temporary test environments, there is no need to have your control plane in dedicated PMs or dedicated physical machines. Simply because. Again, they are temporary. You just want to run your application temporarily in some of these workers, do your tests, and then destroy destroy the machines. So, in terms of speed, in terms of license consumption, in some environments, in terms of uh, complexity, it's easier than to just deploy your Kubernetes control plane as pods and then run your run your workers. A little bit like what you have in EKS, for example. In EKS, you don't have access to your control plane; you only have access to your uh, worker nodes. That's the approach of Cosmotron. Um, so here in that diagram, you can see that I have the management cluster. This is also what we call the, the management plane. In that management plane, uh, um, sorry, mothership, sorry. In that mothership or management cluster, uh, we run the Cosmotron uh, controller. So this is this is basically an operator, Kubernetes operator. And then uh, using cluster API, I'm going to interact with the underlying infrastructure. I'm going to uh, create the virtual machines uh, for the worker nodes in that case. I'm going to create the load balancers, create the volumes. And then uh, out of that, I'm going to deploy KZ OS uh, in the worker nodes. I'm going to deploy the control plane as, as pods. So you can see the pods running here. And basically, you can have multiple child clusters running and managed through that, through that uh, mothership. Right? Both are open source projects, and again, uh, don't hesitate to go and, and check these projects. Uh, and if you do want to contribute, uh, very, very, uh, you're very welcome to do so. Um, sorry, that's that's a little bit hard to read, but this is a reference architecture that we, we made for uh, a cloud service provider uh, in, in France. Uh, where we, we had them uh, run uh, the KZRS plus KZRS Motron service to um, uh, build a Kubernetes as a service offering for their customers. So they wanted to basically they, they had they had uh, in that case a VMware uh, environment. They didn't want to use Tanzu uh, for the uh, Kubernetes as a service offering, and we had them build the Kubernetes as a service offering. Uh, and that's the one of the very high level design that we made. The idea here is we have the mothership, uh, and if you do want to uh, see it in more details, do not hesitate, just reach out, we are at booth 15 and I'm, going to, I'm happy to run through this. Uh, but yeah, here we have the management cluster, uh, which is uh, 
which is a Kubernetes cluster, right? So we have a, we have, we, we deploy the Kubernetes cluster for them. And as from there, uh, the idea was to uh, be able to do some uh, network segmentation where we would be running, uh, where we would be running the infrastructure services. Sorry, where we would be running the infrastructure services. So we had Keycloak for um, identity manager. We had the DNS resolver. We had the uh, Key Vault. Uh, we had uh, um, what did we had uh, also Key Vault. Uh, yes, we had some some mailing services, and then uh, uh, we basically uh, connected the mothership with the target networks where we would be running where we would be running the, the child clusters, right? So here, these are the child clusters that are have uh, that are deployed, and then we had some automation that kind of when we deployed these child clusters, they were then configured in the IDP so that the users would then be able to connect to these to these child clusters, right? So again, it's not that not very, very complicated, but it was all based on Cosmotron and, and KZOS uh, and open source projects. Okay. Um, database as a service and message queue as a service. This is also something that uh, we have a couple of customers coming to us and say we, we, we want to deploy that. Um, uh, so again, uh, that's one of the reference architectures we built uh, for, for, that given, for that given customer. Uh, where on one side, so in that case it was an open stack, um, we decided to segment the project into and use the multi-tenancy capabilities of open stack. So we had one tenant for the object storage and we deployed Minio in that case. So we ran Kubernetes and we uh, deployed Minio within these Kubernetes clusters to run, to run object storage. Uh, we had uh, another tenant uh, where we would be running the database as a service offering and then we partnered with uh, Pure Storage Portworks uh, to do that. Uh, so we leveraged Port Portworks to do that. And then uh, the customer had its own Kubernetes uh, clusters within its own tenant. And basically uh, through the APIs of Portworks, uh, we deployed the different, or they had the ability to deploy themselves, self-service approach. They had the ability to deploy uh, various types of various types of databases. Just rapidly, I can rapidly show you. So this is the this is the the port works oh, the port works UI. services. Um, I have attached it to a Kubernetes cluster in OpenStack, so that my Kubernetes cluster is running here. I have like, these six machines, three controllers, three, three workers running in, in, in OpenStack. And what I did is Access the, the data services UI, and then you can deploy various type of work, um, data um, databases, Kafka, Postgre, Redis, um, and, and and consume these. Right. So again, um, you are adding the, the database as a service capability to your uh, to your offering. So that's that's the that's the full refer reference architecture that we build. Again, uh, sorry, it's a little bit small. Uh, if you want to go through the, these in more details, uh, do not hesitate to come and, and see us at booth 15. We'll go through it. But yeah, I just wanted to show that we do have a lot of services in OpenStack, actually, right? that we, we can leverage uh, from the Nova services, from uh, the Manila services. Uh, we also uh, can use Octavia services, etc. So Neutron services. We do have a lot of services in OpenStack that uh, that um, that you can leverage uh, to uh, to start using to start using 
uh, database as a service, right? The only thing that we added on top of that is Kubernetes and Portworks to give you the, the capability to use database as a service. But a lot of it also comes from, from, from OpenStack. Um, SaaS, so now that we've talked about YAS, we've talked about the past layer, and the past layer is basically Kubernetes, where we start to put in uh, as much uh, or as many open source projects as possible. In terms of, of SaaS, again, uh, we leverage open source. So SaaS for hosting, for example, we use Lagoon. So Lagoon is one of the very, very key projects that we use. This is this has been open sourced by Amazi.io, um, and we have friends from Amazi.io that joined us today, uh, who again is, is at our booth, so don't hesitate to come in and talk to him if you want to learn more about, about uh, Lagoon. But Lagoon is, is one of the very key uh, projects that helps developers to easily host applications, web applications, on top of, of Kubernetes without having to know and learn Kubernetes, right? So that's, that's the magic of, of Lagoon. It's not only GitOps, um, compared to, for example, um, Argo CD, it does way more than it does way more than than, than that. And basically, here, uh, the idea is to simplify the end-to-end -end, uh, user experience for developers, right? So instead of having or have the developer understand Kubernetes, understand multi uh, environment for Kubernetes, basically, in that case, you have uh, uh, your user. Uh, concentrating on coding and, and wanting to deploy their code, interacting with the Lagoon uh, APIs or interface, and then you have all the automation being done by the, by the framework, right? Uh, a little bit like, like what you can also have for MLOps. Uh, basically, you can do a lot of, of, of these MLOps operations using uh, various tooling, but you have uh, very uh, dedicated, specialized tools like uh, Kubeflow, for example, that will allow you to do a lot of these of these automations. Uh, in that case, for example, you have what we have what we have what we have done is we have deployed physical machines uh, using ironic project in OpenStack to leverage the NVIDIA GPUs or BGPUs. We had uh, Kubernetes clusters running Kubeflow, and then uh, basically for the, the data scientists, we wanted to make their life easier, where they wanted to then concentrate on all the discovering. Uh, uh, and, and testing and building the models and then deploying these models, then we, we used we use Kubeflow, right? And Kubeflow is a framework, so you have a lot of these components that you need to select and, and build. This is where it can also be very customized, bespoke, but basically in that case, uh, you can make your life, um, your life easier, right? So that's a more detailed usage. Again, you can come and, and meet us and we'll, we'll go through all, all of this. So just as a summary, um, what I wanted to say is that yes, OpenStack is, is, is great, but it's great at what it's made for. Right? It's don't use OpenStack or try to use OpenStack for what it's not made for. So use it uh, for YAS purposes, select the right uh, features or, or components and, and, and integrate it properly. Kubernetes is the layer that you will be using to link between infrastructure and, and, and applications, and that's also very, very key. Open source for sovereignty reasons, and then when you look at these book use cases, you always have that question of, do you want to use generic tools or specialized tools? In that case, I, I showed you a couple of specialized tools like Lagoon or like, like Kubeflow. But basically, um, uh, yeah, for some of these bespoke use cases, specialized tools is, is one of the best options. Right? This is an example of this bomb, but um, we we'll, um, don't need to go through that. Thank you very much. Come down me down.